Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Anastasia Smirnova. I'm an associate professor of linguistics in the English department at San Francisco State. And today I'll be leading a discussion on chat GPT and its impact on higher education. Our event is structured as follows. I will first introduce the topic and tell you about chat GPT and the questions that we will try to address as part of this discussion. Then we will hear from our panelists. After all panelists present, we will take questions from the audience. Please submit your questions in a Q&A as we go. So our main topic today is chat GPT. Chat GPT is a new technology by OpenAI, a San Francisco based startup. It was released in November last year, and by January, by the end of January, it already had 100 million active users. So this is an unprecedented growth rate. What attracts users to this technology is its ability to produce natural language-like responses to a range of questions. So it can perform on a number of tasks impressively. It can answer factual questions, explain difficult concepts. It can summarize texts. It can write essays in different literary genres. It can write poetry, generate computer code. The tool also has analytical capability and can provide responses in a variety of styles and languages. So for me as a linguist, these are impressive achievements. Not so long ago, natural language technology was still struggling with very basic linguistic tasks. For example, if I ask who is Barack Obama and how old is he, we understand immediately that he refers to Barack Obama. But this was a challenge for AI systems. They could not establish the link between the referent and the pronoun. From this perspective, the performance of ChatGPT is truly impressive. And the implications of this technology go far beyond the field of natural language processing. For education, the main questions are whether and how this technology can be integrated into classrooms to make teaching and learning more effective. And what we see is that teachers, educators, and learners have provided a range of responses. Some programs banned chat GPT in classrooms. The motivations uh, for these are uh, the following. So often, it can give wrong answers and mislead users. It can present answers as truth rather than as a position. It can reproduce bias. Uh, and there are also privacy considerations. So um, OpenAI's uh, website says that users must be over 18 to use ChatGPT. Uh, and there is an understanding that users' data is collected. But um, ChatGPT does not verify age. But then there are also some positive examples of how this technology can be integrated into the classroom. So these examples involve collaborative scenarios where students produce some original work in class, then get response from ChatGPT, compare the answers, and evaluate ChatGPT's uh, replies against their knowledge base. The existence of this type of technology also raises direct questions for assessment. And again, the range of responses here varies from the proclamations that we should fundamentally rethink our assessment methods to more moderate calls for supplementing the current methods with oral exams, uh, video essays, or assignments that draw on students' personal experience. The implications of chat GPT go beyond education. There are questions about the relationship between humans and AI and the place of intelligent machines in our society. For arts, 
It raises the question of creativity and authorship. It also raises the questions of fairness, biases, and environmental impact. We will not be able to address all these questions today. Instead, my hope is that this panel will help us start thinking about this technology and how we, as a community, can address these unique challenges and capitalize on the opportunities that it presents. I'm joined here today by our panelists, faculty and students at San Francisco State. So I'm very excited to introduce to you our panelists. Um, so we have Annika Kulkarni, professor in the computer science department at San Francisco State. So Annika, please tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. I am very excited to be here. Um, my name is Anagha. I am an associate professor in the computer science department at SF State. Um, my PhD is from this place called Language Technologies Institute um, at Carnegie Mellon. And so the chat GPT technology is something that I have been familiar with, the progression of it for a while. And so it's exciting and nerve wracking at the same time to see this latest evolution. So I'll stop at that. Um, Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Annika. Um, so next, I would like to introduce Professor Jennifer Traynor. Uh, so Jennifer is a professor in the English department. She is a colleague of mine. She is in the uh, writing program. So welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, it's nice to be here. Um, as Anastasia said, I'm in the English department. Um, I help direct the undergraduate writing program for first year students, and I teach first year writers. I've been at San Francisco State for 15 years, and I've been teaching writing to first year students for 30. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Christina Rutolo. Um, she is a professor of humanities here at San Francisco State. Hi, I'm also very happy to be here. Um, I am a professor of humanities and I'm chair of the humanities and uh, comparative world literature department. I've been at state for a very, very long time. Um, and I teach writing in various contexts, uh, but mostly writing about literature and the arts. Uh, so we're all very concerned about how this is going to affect us and just starting to wrap our heads around it. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what others have to say and, and questions as well. Thank you, Christina. Um, um, next, I would like to introduce uh, Carlos Montemayor. So Carlos is a professor of philosophy uh, here at San Francisco State. Uh, welcome, Carlos. Thank you, Anastasia. Um, yeah, I teach at the philosophy department uh, and my specialty is philosophy of psychology and uh, philosophy of mind. And I my degree is in uh, PhD in philosophy with a certificate in cognitive science. So I've been following developments on AI and animal cognition and issues related to intelligence. And I also teach at the uh, graduate certificates that uh, San Francisco State uh, is offering now. It's a recent certificate that started uh, three or so years ago, and it involves the College of Business, Computer Science, and Philosophy. Uh, and I'm excited to talk uh, about ChatGPT with all of you here. Thank you, Carlos. Um, I'm also very excited to welcome today our student panelists. So I would like to uh, introduce uh, Mikey uh, Pagan. Uh, Mikey is an MA student in Comparative and World Literature. Welcome, Mikey. Hello, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I'm a MA student at SF State uh, with, with in the uh, Comparative and World Literature Department. And yeah, there, as uh, Christina pointed out, there's a lot of uh, a lot of things to think about and uh, across all of these disciplines. So I'm pretty excited to be here and listen to all the panelists speak. Thanks. Thank you, Mikey. Um, we are also joined today by Ishan Kumar. Uh, Ishan is an MA student in philosophy and the president of the SFSU Student AI Club. Uh, welcome, Ishan. Thank you, Dr. Smanova. Yes, I'm also very excited to be here and uh, 
I'm interested in philosophy of language, philosophy of artificial intelligence. So I've closely followed this development. Um, also excited to give a perspective from the student's point of view on how this technology will affect us in the future and how it can really help us. So. Thank you, Ishan. And a welcome to all the panelists. Um, we will now start our panel. And uh, I want to invite audience to submit their questions in Q&A uh, as we go. And then we will, after all panelists present, we will uh, open the floor for questions. Uh, now I will hand it over to Annika, uh, who will speak on a short history of large language models. All right. I am attempting to start my video, but it won't let me anymore. So if our technical team can help me with that. Okay, but I think you all can see my screen, right? Yes, we can see we can see the slides. Okay. All right. So Okay, all right. I want to uh, start us off with, like the slide says, a very short history of large language models. So starting with what has large language models to do with chat GPT, which is our main topic here today. So first came the language models. They are also called n-gram language models. And I'll tell you about these in a minute. But this was the first. The next thing that came was neural language models. And then came the large neural language models. And chat GPT is a chat interface on top of a large language model. So given that uh, context, I want to give just high level details of each of these three um, milestones in NLP. So language models is what powers uh, the autocomplete feature in our editors, right? So all of us have used have encountered the scenario where we typed in a word and the editor suggested the next words. And chat GPT at the core of it is exactly this. This is what it is trained to do. Look at all the words that have come until now and predict the next word. That's really it. Um, that's at the core of chat GPT. And so this problem has been worked on in in form of language models for a while, since 1990s. So for the last 30 years, um, computational linguists, NLP researchers, computer scientists, AI researchers have been working on this problem, um, especially uh, folks in speech recognition systems. Um, they have spent a lot of time working on language models, um, but other researchers as well, uh, have contributed to language models. And um, for the last 30 years, we have been making do with these language models. And I say making do because we have usually had very simplified, very naive versions of language models. So here I give three examples, three gram, two gram, one gram. And so, as the slide says, three gram, for example, looks at just the previous two words to predict what the current word should be, right? Which any human can tell is a very poor representation of language because language has much longer dependencies between words. But this is all we had because the computations are costly. We didn't have enough data. So because of a lot of just practical constraints, this is what we had. And so we have used it for the past 30 years, right? Um, at most, 
the big companies, the Googles, the Bings, who have large compute power, they were able to use higher order language models, five gram, for example. But that was the extent of it until the neural language models came about. And so neural language models were a big paradigm shift um, for this problem because they introduced us to a whole new way of trying to model language, trying to predict the next word. They brought in learnings from a slightly different domain, from the biological sciences, where the core idea is that the single unit, the neuron is a very simple unit, but when you bring a lot of them together and connect them and arrange them in layers, then magic can start to happen. You can get a very powerful modeling tool when you bring massive number of simple units together. What I didn't say in there is what the next bullet is reminding us that these algorithms are only powerful or rather the tools that come out of these algorithms are only powerful if we give them large amount of representative data. Okay. And this implies that if we, are, if we want to work with large amount of data on these big networks, then we need large amount of compute power as well, right? So there are three things that had to come together for us, for the neural language model to become a reality. The algorithms, the neural network algorithms, which are also called as the deep learning algorithms because they can have several layers of these neural units. Um, so deep learning algorithms had to be invented we had to develop ability uh, to work with large data sets. So computational power, as well as the availability of large data sets. So these three things had to come together for neural language models to become reality and for them to be really useful, effective at the simple task of predicting the next word. And now the last milestone in our progression here, which is the large language models. So uh, large language models are neural language models, but they are just massive. Their model sizes are such that we haven't seen them before. And um, this has happened very quickly in the last five years. We have seen this exponential progress in the field. So in 2018, um, these were the numbers that we were looking at in terms of how big these language models were, how many parameters they had, which was already quite big compared to the 30 years before that. We were never used to talking in terms of millions and millions of parameters. We, at least not academic researchers. But by the end of last year, um, so the chat GPT model, or rather the, language model that powers chat GPT has 175 billion parameters. I, I can't even wrap my head around that number. It just, the numbers lose meaning at this point, right? Um, but that's why they're called the large language models. And to give you a little more progression of the specific technology that chat GPT is based on, so chat GPT was introduced by this company, OpenAI, uh, which was originally a nonprofit. It has become for-profit. And um, OpenAI is getting a lot of uh, news cycle right now, but I want to acknowledge the, that the work that is behind GPTs was done by so many different research groups. Uh, Google was a big player, um, Toronto. So many different companies as well as academic research groups have contributed and OpenAI, what they have done very well is bring it all together. 
and bring it together very fast, actually. Um, so as you can see in this progression, they were putting out models quite fast. And if you look at the parameter numbers, it's order of magnitude bigger the first step, and then it's two orders of magnitude larger parameters. What is not on this slide actually is the more newer models in 2023, which are already talking in trillion parameters. So this, this is just gonna go bigger and bigger is what I can tell uh, right now. So GPT 3.5 was unveiled in March last year and um, they introduced chat GPT, which makes it very easy for people to access uh, the GPT technology um, later last year. So I was teaching my NLP class when this happened. So I had started teaching my NLP class with the very traditional chatbot, an old one called Eliza, which is capable of very basic dialogue. And by the time I finished my class, chat GPT was out and you know, the world had changed. Um, so I think um, that that's my sort of whirlwind tour of language models and how we are at this juncture of chat GPT. And I have a couple more minutes, right? Yes. Okay. So um, here are my few early thoughts. We are all in this um, very fluid state the GPT, this technology is still evolving. And so it is really hard to um, come up with a plan to cope with this technology because it feels like it's a moving target. Um, when you try to come up with a solution for the current state, it feels like it, that state is going to change quite rapidly and we'll be adapting again. But Here's my current take on chat GPT and how it's impacting computer science education. And I was thinking of it from three perspectives. One is the classroom teaching, the other is assessment, and the third is how do we ensure our students get onto a path of career success? Uh, because when you work with chat GPT, it, there is one version, there is one line of thinking which can take you down to a very disappointed, hopeless state that it's doing all the things I can do much better. Um, so this feeling of becoming not relevant, irrelevant. And so how do we prevent our students from feeling that? Um, and so here's, here are my thoughts on some of those topics. And so I think chat GPT has been working like a forcing function for me in my courses where it has made me take a hard long look at how do we want, how do I want to reframe certain things? And so this is one of those where I am being more explicit in my classes um, with my students. So I am explicitly saying this to them that why are we here, right? That why are you choosing to be here and keep that as the main thing rather than the grading and the grades. Um, Cause then hopefully they will, um, the focus will be back on learning rather than just getting the grade and being a code monkey somewhere. Cause that's just not gonna work anymore. The, other thing I want to do in my classes is have students do some amount of reflective essay writing, which is very unusual in CS classes. We, we don't usually do these kinds of things. Essays, I'm sure the first time I do this, my students are gonna be looking um, funny at me. But I think this is, this is important for them to reflect on why are they here 
um, so that they are not trying to just rush themselves into learning just basic coding and getting out of here because that's not going to be sufficient anymore. Um, the other thing that ChatGPT has forced me to do is talk more about my research projects because when I have tried to test that will, which of my research projects will become redundant now that ChatGPT does what it does. And none of my research projects have become redundant. They all need me and my students working on them. And so I want to showcase that. I usually don't in an intro NLP course, I don't really talk a lot about the research projects that are going on in my lab. And I'll have to change that. Um, I have to talk more about these projects in the intro NLP course because then the students can see why they will still be relevant, where humans are still needed. Um, so that's one thing and uh, another reflective activity. Um, I think there is, I, I did this myself as well. I used ChatGPT as a study partner for a topic that I was curious about. And it was great, honestly. It, I think I was a lot more productive in terms of making progress in my understanding of that topic. I was able to internalize a lot more. So I think it's students will benefit from this as well. They using chat GPT or tools like it as their study partners. And uh, assessment, I think formative assessment is such a tricky thing to scale up um, in classes where you have 50 students, right? I, I honestly want to provide them feedback every week, but it's hard to do when you have 50 plus students. And I think chat GPT can help me there. And so that's one place where I want to see if we can leverage this technology. And lastly, um, usually we, when we develop assignments, we try to keep them deliberately sort of small in scope so that the student isn't trying to get their head around many new things. Um, but I think if they are going to use chat GPT to do smaller tasks, then we can shift away from this small scope programming assignments and start to assign larger, potentially even interdisciplinary programming projects where now they really have to apply themselves. They can liberate themselves from smaller, more simple coding tasks, but then they have to be doing the high level thinking. And that I believe is actually helpful to them as they move towards becoming a software developer, where in their jobs, they do have to do exactly what these assignments will ask them to do. So that's, those are my early thoughts. And this slide is more or less the same content as the previous one, but a little more general in terms of not just being about computer science, but higher education. These are the points that I think can transfer to other fields as well. So with that, I wanna stop. Uh, I'll share these slides later. This first link there is a compilation of many great articles about ChatGPT. I had fun reading through some of them. I haven't gotten through all of them. Uh, but both these links are really good reads. So I'll share this afterwards. Anastasia, is this enough for now? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Annika. Uh, I can definitely relate to the need to uh, revise the content um, as uh, I teach applied computational linguistic this semester. And with, when we talk about basic um, NLP tasks, suddenly lots of them are solved. <laughs> so, so that is definitely a big change. Uh, so uh, there are a lot, lots of um, questions um, uh, for 
education and for assessment. So thank you, Annika, for uh, sharing your perspective on that. Uh, we will um, address uh, questions uh, after all panelists present. And uh, now I want to uh, hand it over to Jennifer Traynor, who will speak on uh, talking with first year students about writing, identity, and technology. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. I think I can build on it. Um, uh, as you know, I'm in the writing program in lower division here at San Francisco State. And in the writing program, students tell us all the time that they see school writing as robotic, requiring them to use formulas set by assignments, address topics chosen by someone else to perform, conform under conditions not of their choosing. That problem that students feel like robot writers in school, in high school, but sometimes also in college is longstanding such that we have had it as a focus in the curriculum, in the writing program and in research for a while. Um, well before text generation tools like ChatGPT, Mary Soliday and I published an article called Literacy in the Age of the Machine, focused on San Francisco State's feelings, students' feelings about them writing in school. Seven years later, we are in the middle of a big research project. We have 2,000 student essays archived, and we're analyzing them, looking at, among other things, how students learn to develop agency as writers and overcome that sense of being a robot. So this semester, I'm teaching two, some, two sections of English 114, which is the first course um, in, the fir in the first year, first writing course in a sequence that culminates in GUAR. So in 114, the curriculum focuses on writing as thinking, self-expression, metacognition, reflection, identity, and voice. In the second semester writing course, most of you may know it as Area E, it's our Area E is 216. Um, they focus, that goes from what I think to what, how I can persuade others about what I think, how I can join a conversation with others about what I think. It's more on persuasion, rhetoric, genre awareness, and information literacy. So, but in my 114s this spring, I began like I normally do um, with a unit on identity and voice. Students read Killing the Five Paragraph Essay, um, some summaries and critical perspectives on education. They also read about digital identity and writing, including an essay by Gia Tolentino called The Eye in Internet. The focus on class discussion in the first few weeks of this semester was on how both social media literacy practices and school literacy practices feel to most students inauthentic, disconnected from their identities and their true opinions. Since text generation tools like ChatGPT exploded on the scene in November and in January, we were seeing so much press about it. I was thinking throughout this unit about the relationship between these tools and the discussion my students were having. So as a wrap up to the unit, which just finished last week, I introduced the following idea. I said, we have been analyzing why our writing feels performative online and robotic in school. Let's flip the switch. If we write like robots, can a robot write like a human? So I just went there. I asked them if they knew what text generation generative tools were, whether they'd heard of ChatGPT. Almost all of them had, I mean, 80 to 90% at least. I asked them to get in small groups, demo it on their phones or laptops, they were excited, exclaiming, and experimenting, very engaged. One of the comments I overheard at this point was, man, I wished I'd had this in high school. So then I did a four corners activity um, where students address this question, can a robot write? And so yes, no, maybe yes, no, maybe not. Um, and then for homework that night, I put two chat transcripts on our annotation site. Um, we had made the chats you know, transcripts while they were in their small groups. And I asked them to respond to this question. What's interesting in the prompts? It, what's interesting in these transcripts, the prompts or the answers and why? So I'm gonna share a little bit about what I learned from listening to students in the discussion and from their annotations and all this is shared with permission. Um, several students in the conversations said they believe that ChatGPT was simply a more advanced search engine. They said it will write you a narrative about the topic instead of just giving you links you have to look at. If you trust Google, you can trust this. Most students drew a line between writing that mattered to them and writing that didn't, and chat was good, they said, for the latter, for writing that doesn't matter. 
The information I got wasn't enough to help me with my philosophy paper, one student said. I asked for its opinion, but it wouldn't tell me. It works well for writing that doesn't require emotion, like research papers. It makes a lot of homework and writing assignments a lot easier. A few students thought chat would level the playing field and eliminate linguistic discrimination. I never get my ideas across in English because it's like a lot of mistakes and it doesn't flow. You get judged as a bad writer. For people like that, this would help. It will make everybody seem like they know how to structure their sentences. So that will give them more of a chance. Many students expressed a very critical perspective. What's this purpose? Why would they make this? I wouldn't trust it for health information. You're really trusting the engineers who made this. This will create more echo chambers. Like now you can only read the perspectives of people you want to hear. This will make it easy to write from the perspective you want. The algorithm picks what you read and AI decides what, you, what you'll write. This will be really bad for younger kids. They expressed a sense of loss. I think it's sad that our kids won't be able to tell a human from a bot. We perform online and now literally we don't even have to try to perform, the chat will do it for us. Writing is where I do all my thinking. I don't want the bot to write for us. Students also made a connection between school writing and text generation tools like ChatGPT. The kind of writing that chat does, it's what our teachers try to get us to do. It's like five paragraph essays and perfect paragraph structures that don't have any personality, which we were taught in high school. It borrows from other authors, data scraping from the internet, but we do too. It does what school has trained us to do, like write a perfectly formatted essay that is based on some random people's ideas. I asked, I asked students what they thought teachers should do in the face of this new technology or this new tool. They said, care more about what we say than how we say it. Give us more time to write so we don't feel so pressured. Make assignments more about our life and opinions. Teach us how to use technology so people aren't fooled by misinformation. Allow us to make mistakes without losing points and getting shut down. Finally, I asked them how they thought students should approach these new tools. Use it for brainstorming, but make the writing your own. Try to find the sources for what chat is saying. Make sure it's correct. Use it for editing if your teacher cares about grammar. Make sure you can stand behind what chat produces if you're going to use it. Someone could call you out on it. You better know what you're putting under your name. Don't put teacher's assignments or other people's writing in chat without their permission. You don't know how it's going to get used. So students' main takeaways were that chat, the writing that chat produced was formulaic, structured, perfect, but lacked authenticity. But for this reason, they also concluded it would be useful for some types of school writing. So here are some of the ways that I am currently thinking about this and some tips maybe for best practices. I don't think I have any answers here that will change the, change the world. But I think the first thing is to recognize that tools are always a part of writing and they can have a democratizing effect as some of my students pointed out. We can incorporate tools into critical information literacy education, and we should. It's not enough merely to tell students that text generation tools may not be credible or aren't credible or to police their use of them. At Stanford, undergrads are already using ChatGPT to draft cover letters for internships as a way to save time so they can work on other things. If we focus myopically on banning it or policing it, we deprive our students of that kind of tool use and it's an equity and an access you know, it's an opportunity loss for them. Instead, I think we can teach critical media and information literacy and incorporate these tools into that. If you're teaching writing, you know this already, focus on the process and not the product. That is always good advice for a writing class, no matter what the tools are. Collaborate with students, engage them in conversation about genre expectations and requirements for writing. Students really struggle to see their rhetorical purpose in the tangle of genre expectations and instructions that they encounter in assignments. Many of those instructions are written by us in an effort to help them, but students see kind of a blizzard of rules and mandates. This can lead them to conclude that their thinking doesn't matter and that text generators would do just as well. Help students take ownership of their writing. Use the word byline to help students understand that their own writing, that they, are, that they own their writing, 
and they're accountable to their audience, no matter what tools that they used or what process they went through. Use student writing in class. Um, the things you're, the images you're seeing on these last few si slides are my effort to do that in my classes where I try to make students published authors in the realm of our classroom, do presentations based on their writing, round robin readings, performances, ask students to annotate their own and each other's writing, celebrate their writing. So in the writing program right now, if I can speak for us, I think that our plan is to continue to follow our traditions and those of our field, which means talking openly with students about their writing and their learning, focusing on what, what works for them and what doesn't and why, focusing on critical literacy and information literacy, and writing as meaning making. I think we'll continue to follow Lisa Delpit, a scholar in our field who long ago exhorted us to fight for social justice by valuing linguistic diversity, celebrating students' diverse ways with words, and teaching students about the racism and classism behind all kinds of efforts to standardize language from school and assessment to you know, technology that you know, pr promotes one voice. Delpit also urged us to give students access to linguistic tools and to the codes of power, which I think we will continue to do. And most importantly, she tells us to advocate beyond the classroom, to make the world a welcoming place for all kinds of writers, even or maybe I think especially those whose English doesn't conform to the machine. So a final thought along these lines, um, the CEO of OpenAI just last weekend tweeted that he sees a future use for ChatGPT as providing medical bots for those who can't afford healthcare. You know, let that sink in for a minute. Amid all there is to worry about and wonder over with this new technology, I think it's important to remember that there's corporate interest behind it and that there are assumptions being made by corporate leaders about our society and how it should work. It's imperative that we and our students are critical users, but also critical of digital tools and technology, that we empower students to critique technology and that we ourselves are ready to take an activist role, rejecting assumptions and techno technologies that don't serve our students' interests. Uh, I wanna thank a bunch of people who helped me think about this really quickly. I need to call out John Holland and Robert Coles and Esther Chan and Sarah Felder and Jennifer Beach and Kristen Wong and Brian Strang. A lot of people have been talking with me about this and it's been great. I think I've read more than I probably should have about AI in the last few weeks. Um, if you are interested in a practical, no hype, tips and best practices website, I recommend criticalai.org, uh, put together by folks in our field. It's got a lot of resources and it's it's really well laid out. Um, I'm also happy to talk more about this, so reach out. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, so it was uh, very informative to hear about first your students' perspectives. And I think that their thoughts reflect um, all these concerns that um, we voice. And it's right. very nice to hear that there is, um, we are in alignment uh, about this, but of course there is much more because uh, this technology will affect in a critical way um, their professional lives perhaps. Yeah. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, I will now hand it over to uh, Christina, uh, who will speak on humanities pedagogy in the age of chat uh, GPT, early musings. Welcome, Christina. Hi, um, that, was, that was wonderful, Jennifer. And I should have predicted that you would be speaking so eloquently about the teaching of writing, which I'm gonna speak less eloquently about and maybe repeat a lot of what you've said. Um, as I said, I teach in the humanities program and much of our teaching uh, focuses on getting students to read carefully across the arts, verbal, visual, musical, to think about big questions, about what it means to be human, about you know, big ideas um, through uh, interpreting and reading closely and becoming familiar with um, various artistic and cultural forms and learning how to read them critically. Uh, we incorporate writing in, in most of our courses, uh, but we've been rethinking for a long time in the ways that you know those who who are specifically teaching writing in the humanities have been doing for a while now. Um, but I 
I'm getting ahead of myself. I so I just wanted to start by so I I'm no expert here, and I'm going to be sort of speaking more loosely. I don't have a really focused presentation for you. It's more a series of thoughts that I've been having, and my colleagues have been having. Um, and and I am starting uh, with my three stages of chat. GPT response, um, we all kind of were in denial for a while for some reason in my department. And I think we really thought, oh, we'd be able to know it when we saw it. And um, we, we somehow didn't grasp how much it, it might change uh, our students' approach to learning and our therefore our approach to teaching. Uh, then as we became more familiar with it, we kind of jumped into, or at least some of us, um, a kind of panic, like, how are we going to police this? You know, how are we going to know it when we see it? Um, how are we going to keep students from wanting to use it? Uh, and especially as I started playing around with it myself, it seemed pretty clear how tempting it would be um, for any range of um, writing assignments that we might be giving our students. Um, and after I got over the panic, or, and uh, I, and I think my a lot of my colleagues are still in that mode, but um, you know, as I started to read more about it and think more about it, um, and and begin to start talking to students about it, the question then became: Okay, this is clearly here to stay. It's incredibly sophisticated. It hasn't yet really been monetized, and we're sort of in the beginning stages of its deployment. Um, and instead of asking ourselves how we can teach around it or get our students not to use it, clearly we need to start teaching it in our classes directly. Um, and in our case, I think teaching it both as an emerging technology um, that is emerging for particular reasons at a particular point in history um, and, um, and, and that is, one in a series of technologies of writing and knowledge production um, and representation. Uh, and then also to think of it as a form of writing um, that, that brings its own possibilities and limits. So I will proceed to sort of muse on how we might teach this. Um, so as Jennifer was saying, you know, in the humanities, we've really evolved our approach to teaching writing from that sort of stale, wooden, robotic, as she put it, and her students put it, um, you know, five paragraph essay, thesis statement, evidence, et cetera, to get our students to really think of writing as a form of thinking, a form of developing ideas, a way to... Um, to get in touch with one's responses, in our case, to, to the art and um, cultural works that they're studying, to find words to articulate those responses, to ask good questions, to develop ideas through from the beginning to the end, through writing drafts, through revising, um, and through writing for each other and for our classroom and, and entering a conversation. Um, like Jennifer in her classes, we are trying to get our students to become aware of and to gain practice in diverse genres of writing, not just the five paragraph essay, which is really kind of useful only in an academic setting, but to think about sort of where in the world do people write about the arts in mean, meaningful ways today? Um, and what are the genres in which they write? You know, there's the analytical writing, there's critical writing, there's descriptive writing, there's celebratory writing, there's personal writing. Um, and then to think about writing and the use of language, um, and this is particularly the case in our interdisciplinary humanities program where we're really teaching across creative forms, to think of writing as one of many different forms of communication, expression, and thinking that bring its own special powers and its own limits. Um, and that of course will give them agency, effectiveness, mobility in their lives in a, in a world that still really privileges writing um, in many, many different contexts. So, you know, writing is 
is very much embedded in the way we teach and we really are trying to get students to want to learn to write to become curious about their writing to see writing as a process and not just something to to churn out to get to get a grade um so how to use chat gpt uh to to contribute to this effort to to turn our students into um into writers um so Unlike Jennifer, I have not yet tried this out on students, so I was really heartened by what she just presented, um, and it's really a version of something I, I will will want to do in the future. Um, but but that is to really get the students to think about what is the difference between the writing that Chat GPT can do and human writing, um, and and to get them to think about it along with me, not, not for me to teach it to them, um, to get them to think about it as really the generation for whom this technology is going to change everything or influence everything, and the generation that is going to have to decide really on how it will be used. Um, so, and uh, Annika kind of helped us think about this. Uh, and and once you start playing with it, you really see it. Writing is a it 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 is at heart kind of a series of choices. It's a linear process where you put one word after another, um, and and your work is choosing what that next word is going to be, and those choices are influenced. And I think it's useful to start thinking about how this is true for humans, as it's true for these uh, programs for 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 the algorithm or I don't even know how to talk about the technology yet, but you know what I'm saying. Um, the choices are influenced in both humans and chat GPT AI by an accumulated archive and experience of language, you know, a grammar, a vocabulary, a syntax, and also an accumulated experience of, of genre conventions, right, of um, appropriate ways to write um, about certain things and in certain contexts. Um, and, you know, when we teach writing, I think it's really important to get students to think about genre. Genres is something that they inherit, that give them access to an audience, that give them a kind of structure that will meet their readers' expectations. Um, and chat GPT, what it's so what it seems to me to be so good at is it just so quickly learns these genre conventions um, and is able just instantaneously to make these choices that fall into the sort of most commonly used genre conventions. So what else? Students, I think, will be quick to say, clearly the personal comes into it as well, right? Human writing. And maybe chat GPT lacks this, maybe not according to a recent New York Times article where uh, the Bing AI declared its love for the person using it. But, um, but you know, the individual writing has certain goals, certain desires, certain biases, certain idiosyncrasies that are also going to affect these choices and perhaps make it, make their writing unique, distinct, have their own style. Uh, sorry, I just realized I'm not doing this as a, oh, it doesn't matter. Um, so I think that's a conversation that, that we should be having with our students to get them to think about their own writing as, okay, robotic. I mean, there's, there's a place for sort of learning the rules, right? Um, but there's also a time and place for breaking the rules and, and um, to sort of think about how uh, the value of that and the process of that as being in some ways shared between robots and humans, but in some ways perhaps not. Uh, and then to have them think about what genres, what contexts of writing might AI be good at and appropriate for, um, and where would you prefer to know that the writer that you're reading is human? Uh, I think this could be, you know, an assignment to give to our students to really think about um, uh, what they'd be okay with as readers 
knowing or not knowing whether it's human written or AI written? And what wouldn't they be okay with not knowing whether it was AI written or human written? Um, and then to also raise the question of ethics. You know, how might we use AI ethically in our own writing processes? And I'm, you know, I'm already getting ideas from, from Jennifer and, and Annika and, uh, you know, for the ways in which AI can, can help us um, generate ideas and can help us with our writing. So that would be another question I would add now that I hadn't even really been thinking about, you know, can, can AI give us, uh, get us started, give us perhaps ideas we hadn't had before for questions we could be asking, research questions, um, outlines, for instance. What is the ethics of that? You know, what, what, what is cheating and what is not cheating? And get the students to be thinking about this along with us. Um, okay. So the other thing, the other, so besides the sort of teaching of writing, in the humanities, we're also always no matter what topic we're approaching, we're always asking our students to think historically and to historicize um, not just the individual works that they are studying, but um, the, the language, the, um, the form that those works are being expressed in. And I think Clearly, we should be getting our students to think about how writing itself, of course, has a history and technologies of writing have a history. Uh, and uh, they are at a moment in history that's been preceded by other moments when there's been profound changes in um, what it means to write and how we write. Uh, and, you know, I, in my own life, the invention of the word processor, I started writing with a typewriter and then started using a word processor. And what difference did it make to be able to cut and paste? That seems like ancient history now, but at the time it was like this really profound thing. Like suddenly you could move huge pieces of text from one place to another. Um, different implications than chat GPT altogether, yet changing everything in a way. Um, getting them to think about these genres that they're writing in and that chat GPT is itself learning and and generating in its writing um, genres have a history genres change due to historical pressures um, I just taught Frederick Douglass's narrative in one of my classes where Douglass is able to write a kind of narrative that hadn't been written before and insert a voice that hadn't had a place in American literature before in part because he mastered the genres of his moment. He learned to read and write when he wasn't supposed to uh, as a slave. And then after he escaped, he became a, a, a reader who soaked in the genres of his moment, became a master of their conventions, and wrote this narrative that would reach its audience, um, but at the same time was able to manipulate those conventions and see their limits and see how they had to be broken in order to bring his own perspective, having grown up under slavery um, as an African American um, who also was familiar with a completely different set of conventions and genres of expression, of oral expression, of musical expression, um, that he then made a place for in his narrative. This is an example of um, the emergence of a new genre that uh, perhaps would be prevented uh, by a technology like ChatGPT, which is in some way sort of reinforcing existing genres. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's worth thinking about, right? So to, to get them to think about their relationship to genres and, and the history of genres, to get them to think about um, the history of authorship and what kinds of privileges and powers authorship has, um, has uh, meant at different times and place, who gets access to authorship, what does it mean to be an author, <clears throat> um, and who is the author 
in a text generated by chat GPT. Um, and I think for me, sort of especially given this sort of moment that we're at at the beginning of the of thinking about how this can be used um, and of its deployment and of its perhaps, you know, uh, it, it's sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the word, but it's, you know, it's it's now sort of being tested, right? It's free for everyone's use. We're all sort of part of the process of its testing. Um, but at some point, right, there'll be the next step where it becomes monetized and it becomes, um, uh, you know, it, it, it'll enter a new phase. Um, so given that we're at the beginning of this stage, these questions of sort of uh, who's going to make the decisions, how are the decisions going to be made as we move into the next phase, and what is the relationship of this technology to power? You know, what is gained, what is lost? Who is gaining? Who is losing? Uh, and, and what might be possible but not profitable with this technology? How might it be used to create new possibilities of expression, um, new, um, new cultural forms, for instance, uh, new forms of creativity that uh, might not actually uh, be profitable but might be meaningful. So those are my thoughts. I rambled a bit, but um, I hope they contribute to the conversation. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, these are very important questions. I, uh, again, as someone who works in um, linguistics and teaches computational linguistics, I also think about the process in which um, uh, chat GPT, the architecture and how it was trained and that um, there is a human component in a pipeline, uh, but then um, the, uh, what exactly is uh, reinforced as positive uh, learning example and what is considered a negative learning example in this process. So it has direct relationship um, to the question about power, who decides what is a good answer and what is a bad answer. So I think that's that that's very important. Uh, and then uh, your question about uh, new uh, genres and also the possibility of creating new genres. I think here we are uh, approaching a very interesting territory. If chat GPT is trained on existing data, can is it capable of uh, producing something completely novel and whether by using it, we actually uh, deprive ourselves of this uh, possibility. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I invite our audience to post questions in Q&A. And um, now we will move on to our next talk. So I want to invite um, Carlos, who will speak on large language models and risky communication. Okay, uh, thank you. Um... Okay, so uh, I'm going to be a lot more uh, skeptical, I think, about the technology, but also uh, give a little bit more context of what I think is important about it. I agree with uh, everything that was said in the previous panels. Um, one thing I, I think is important is that uh, uh, we we tend to uh, hype uh, this kind of technology, we trust technology kind of blindly. Uh, I want, I think it's very important to stress, you know, a couple of times this uh, came up before that this is a technology produced by a company, right? Uh, this is uh, not some like kind of magical emergence of uh, an intelligent system. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to actually, um, I mean, the, the, the background for how, how much energy and, and resources are being put into this is because uh, ever since the work of Alan Turing, uh, language has been the cornerstone of uh, whether uh, someone is intelligent and whether a machine can be intelligent. Uh, and uh, chat GPT is definitely impressive in this regard. Uh, but I want to uh, develop some ideas uh, from philosophy of language, actually, to, 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 to just... Uh, um, uh, challenge some of, well, not a challenge, but uh, shed some uh, 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 think that there's uh, reasons for skepticism. Sorry, I'm going to 
Uh, so language, uh, again, as I was saying, is, is, is what uh, uh, computer code is a kind of language has its own syntax. Uh, computer science emerged uh, in various ways as a, as a way of understanding languages and, and its syntax. So there's a very deep, long connection between computers and language systems. Uh, now, language is not just a set of symbolic representations or a set of computations, essentially human language, uh, which is something that, uh, as far as we know, in the kind of complex communicative uh, intentional system that we have it is a unique human feature, but of course, animal communicate in all sorts of ways uh, through uh, attending jointly to their environments. Uh, so language is, of course, not just uh, computation and symbol representation syntax. It is essentially a communal activity. Uh, it's an activity that that was essential in a revolution. And uh, it's also uh, something that uh, deserves to be uh, noted as uh, the source of many of our best uh, things, including arts and novels and uh artistic expression is a kind of communication. So communication is much more complicated than just language production. Uh, but of course, language production of the kind that GPT, chat GPT is doing is, is definitely a, a, an important achievement. Here, I want to stress a different size of linguistic communication, uh, which is why, when is it that, that an exchange, uh, 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 sort of like a communicative exchange or a symbolic exchange, uh, an exchange of sentences, uh, when does when when is it that that's a genuine conversational exchange? And the reason why this is a central question is because this is the source uh, of trust that we have uh, in in communicating with other speakers. That we trust what they tell us because we're engaging in a genuine conversational exchange. Is not a, a, a fake. Is not a pretense. Is not a trickery. Is not manipulative. It we're we're expressing. Uh, something that we communicate and the, the, the recipient is understanding it and, and jointly attending to it. This is very important. So for these systems to become genuinely intelligent, and this is important for, as, as I'm about to say in a second, for educational context, this issue of shares, communicative intentions and joint attention is essential. Uh, and of course, this is the holy grail of AI. How is it that we could achieve general artificial intelligence. And so uh, the, yeah, the point of these slides, and I, I don't have uh, many slides, this is probably one of the most important slides, is that um, conversational intelligence uh, is an aspect of a linguistic community. And in, in, in a linguistic community, uh, speakers don't respond to each other sort of like algorithmically or predictively, right? Like they don't, they don't look at a database and, and just like spit out a pattern recognition kind of selection, which is what these systems do. In fact, most of us would be incredibly offended if, if that's where speakers of a community did systematically to our, to our uh, utterances. Uh, and that's because an essential aspect of an, any conversational exchange is again, that we need to jointly attend and act with other speakers uh, through, through, through the things we say, through the th things we, uh, uh, express through uh, joint ways of uh, engaging in, in, in a joke or, or in, a, in a very serious set of assertions as in an educational context. But the idea is, uh, I think part of the, part of the reason uh, some students feel like robots is because uh, some of our academic writing has emphasized the sort of algorithmic side of reproducing text rather than this shares educational background. But of course, in no class would you find a teacher that, or a set of students that just sort of, uh, in, in, a, in the pejorative way that I'm expressing, just would spit out chains of sentences based on some database, right? Like that, that's something that even in the most robotic of situations, we, we just never do. And again, it would be something that we manipulative and, and, and insulting. And I think that's a source of, of uh, concern with these systems that uh, we should uh, be cautious about especially as we deploy them and, and they become commercialized in, into our uh, classrooms. Um, this aspect of communication, I think, is a fundamental challenge for systems like ChatGPT or, or, uh, or, or uh, 
the predecessor uh, GPT-3, uh, because representing the world in a way that makes conversational common ground salient, right? So if we're telling a joke or, or we're in a class or someone says something very serious, there's an accident and someone is saying something about uh, what happened. Uh, the conversational background, we're very good at, at, at immediately narrating the situation, immediately getting what's important, what's salient. And, and we do that collectively. This is the key point. We don't do that in a, in a, in a sort of like private database kind of way, looking for patterns. We, we, we immediately, uh, almost automatically, uh, look for how others are uh, communicating, look at what they're expressing, like their expression in general, uh, see what's salient of a situation. And that's like 80%. Of, of what happens in, in linguistic communication. I mean, of course, the words we'd say are very important as well, but uh, a lot of it is, is, is uh, the, a lot of the meaning and uh, pragmatic, pragmatic effects, what, the, the way those sentences relate to actions need to happen in a context where other speakers can, can uh, quickly uh, create a common ground with us uh, and jointly attend to what we're doing. I think this is a fundamental uh, limitation of these systems. And, and, and because of that, uh, a, a big worry about whether we should trust them uh, full heartedly and, and a big worry about like how risky they are in conversational exchanges. Uh, and, and think of, again, of, of, the, of, of, uh, of the example that Jennifer gave of like uh, caregiving facilities, medical caregiving facilities. I think deploying these systems there is quite risky. <clears throat> um, and um, the risk comes from the fact that uh, so far, even though these, these systems are quite impressive and, and, and they do incredibly complicated things, uh, they're not genuinely intelligent in the, in, in the sense that I was just talking about, right? So uh, a genuinely intelligent agent, and, and even Alan Turing wrote this in his very famous paper uh, on, the, on the Turing test. Uh, you, you need to, 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 to have a genuine, genuinely intelligent conversation. You need to be able to keep track of the communicative intentions of others, right? So joint motivation, joint, there's not only joint attention, but joint motivations and intentions uh, seem to be really completely absent from the standard way in which these systems work. I mean, it would be actually quite amazing if they could reach that. I, I think if they reach that, they, they, we got general artificial intelligence. And if we got that, we're in much deeper trouble than what happens to our classrooms. Um, and uh, so then what I think is that caution is needed regarding the risk created by these systems, uh, because we, we tend to immediately count them as intelligent, right? But even though they don't really have communic communicational intentions or communicative intentions, uh, and thereby these, these can, produ can produce fake, unreliable, or even manipulative exchanges, not, not because the company wants to trick us or, or because the system wants to trick us, it's because they, they're not keeping track of our communicational intentions. They're keeping track of something entirely different. Uh, it's something like a string of, you know, uh, set of, I mean, a very com complicated, of course, set of patterns that predict what's, what's coming next. Um, and that's uh, basically what I wanted to say just uh, again, to, to, to bring some other kind of uh, different perspective to this issue. And this, uh, I mean, if you're interested, I, I wrote uh, a paper on this uh, uh, called Language and Intelligence, and it is about GPT-3, not uh, chat GPT, but uh, uh, if you're interested, you can contact me and, and I can make the, the paper available to you. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, so these are very, uh, very uh, interesting uh, and um, uh, interesting thoughts on the nature of um, human communication and uh, where exactly chat GPT is with respect to this uh, criteria. Uh, I need to admit that um, as part of my classes, I teach pragmatics and um, for a very long time, um, pragmatic reasoning has been a challenge for uh, AI systems. But we also did experiment a little bit uh, with my students uh, with basic um, 
contextual reasoning. So, uh, for example, there is a uh, relevance principle in pragmatics. If I say I would like to get a cup of coffee and someone else says there is a place around the corner called Joe. And by the relevance principle, uh, I assume that Joe sells coffee, even though my interlocutor didn't say that explicitly. And uh, when we tested these mini scenarios, we actually got, got very good responses from chat uh, GPT. But um, I think you're, you, you, you're pointing out uh, to whether it actually is able to keep users' intentions throughout the whole uh, conversation. And that's, again, I think that's a, um, that, that's a very good question that um, challenges this perspective on chat GPT as an uh, all-powerful, uh, competent uh, tool. So thank you for this presentation. We, are, we now will be moving on to um, our student panelists. So I'm very excited to uh, welcome uh, Mikey uh, Pagan. Uh, who will um, present um, on um, chat GPT um, and um, uh, arts. So welcome, welcome, Mikey. Hi, thank you, Anastasia, and thank you to all the panelists for speaking. That was all very fascinating. Uh, yeah, so let me just go ahead and share my PowerPoint. Uh, Cool. So, yeah, so um, the way I sort of approached this question when it was brought up to me was um, at which point I had never really used ChatGPT, but I had been sort of following it in the news over the past few months, as I'm sure many of us have. have. Um, so one of the ways I started to approach this, one of my first steps was to sort of just like ask around uh, sort of uh, people that are, that are friends of mine that are at SF State who are cohorts at, in different programs or whatever. And it seemed to me like kind of like one of the major anxieties around ChatGPT rests around kind of creative writing. Um, and kind of just like, yeah, that like uh, kind of playing into what constitutes the art, like what is the role of the artist in these sort of situations or whatever. Um, and especially one of my friends in who's an MA in the poetry department uh, framed this anxiety as sort of like, oh, well, you could just have ChatGPT generate a, a 50, 100 poems within a couple of hours, send them to every review journal in the country, and chances are one of them will stick and you'll get something. And like, what does that mean for somebody who actually works on the craft? Um, sort of speaking to what Carlos was speaking about genu genuineness. Um, for me, I guess, uh, in sort of these conversations sort of built around like the, the idea of like, the creative act, the, the idea, the artist's idea and its execution. Um, and there really is no separation between the two, in my view, like uh, a, a, a painter is going to develop their uh, creative process through the act of painting, right? Uh, same thing with the poet, same thing with an, the author of a literary text. However, there, there's always going to be room for content creation. Um, and I guess in this case is kind of where ChatGPT plays a role in the arts and especially in the arts relation to higher education. Because it's important to keep in mind uh, sort of like the incentives behind the creation of art and content, especially on the internet where the driving motivation is user engagement and uh, data collection for the sake of advertising. Um, and, and likewise, it's important to remind ourselves sort of the wellspring from which AI language models and generative AI technologies pull from, which is that of human creative labor. Uh, more AI sort of pulls from the data sets that it's that it has been pulling from. It's gonna eventually try to pull from itself and like create these sort of like recursive um, pitfalls, I guess, of, of where it, they just sort of start to repeat themselves. Um, I guess in that, in that regard, one of the potential pitfalls and dangers of uh, AI use, especially in the higher education and the, and the fine arts are 
you know, the idea of authenticity and creativity, at what point, uh, who owns the art, who made the art is, uh, if there is no that, um, if you're just asking a computer to do it for you. But to me, kind of a bigger problem, especially in the modern university, uh, sort of, and especially in the frame of what can be seen as like a neoliberal university of running a school as a business is sort of this, like, the issue of data privacy and transparency. Um, as, as Jennifer pointed out earlier, you know, there's these corporate incentives of AI and these corporate assumptions about what society is and what, how schools should be run and what the purpose of, of higher education is, especially in regards to arts. So that to me is a much bigger problem that we should be focusing on. And of course there's bias, the bias of like uh, the fact that it's pulling from, you know, largely Western frameworks and data sets, it's going to reproduce these sorts of biases. But I do feel like in the university, we, at least at SF State, in my experience, we have a lot of experience sort of working through those biases because they will reproduce just kind of naturally. So to me, data privacy and transparency are kind of the biggest issues. Um, and so I guess like those are some of those, especially as students and teachers and future teachers and future students and all of that. Um, you know, of course, ChatGPT certainly has this like potential to revolutionize the way we approach higher learning and the arts, but there's the ethical and philosophical implications of using AI generated content. And sort of just like understanding that continuing need to balance AI content with human creative labor and with uh, honing critical thinking skills in that context. And I think that that's kind of going to be our role uh, moving forward, as many of the other panelists have sort of like pointed out already. It makes me feel really good about what uh, the students are walking into. But yeah, we'll just like, you know, the we are kind of at the, we're beholden sort of to the people who are programming this, right? And so we can't really trust them to, to necessarily to make an ethical product. So it will be us to, for us to continue honing those creative, critical thinking skills so that we can ethically use the product, whatever that product ends up being. Because as Anika said, you know, it's not going away. It's going to get, get bigger and bigger and it is a moving target. So we kind of just need to be focused on sort of following it and see how it continues to move as we as we continue to work with it as a continuous effect to our studies. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mikey. Uh, so there are, again, there are so many important questions uh, in your presentation. Uh, so the question of bias, right, and uh, the kind of data that uh, these models are trained on. Um, Again, uh, if it's data from internet, they are overrepresent certain groups, right? And uh, other groups are not represented at all. Uh, and then it affects, in a way, um, the language that is generated um, by chat GPT. There are indeed efforts to address this issue, but um, again, we would like to know more about uh, the processes um, and the mechanisms and um, who controls that and who chooses what kind of data uh, is used to train these models. But thank you so much. We, uh, if you have questions, please uh, post them in uh, Q&A and we will address them after all panelists present. Uh, and now I would like to welcome uh, Ishan, who will speak on chat GPT uh, uses, misuses, and the issue of uh, translation. Welcome Ishan. Uh, Ishan, I think you are muted. Can you can you check the uh, microphone? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, Dr. Smirno, can you uh, share my PowerPoint? Because I think it mutes while I'm uh, sharing for some reason. By any chance?
It's shared right now. I think you're okay. Oh, it's sharing right now? Oh, okay. Okay. Never mind then. Okay. Yeah, so uh, since we're constrained for time, I'll be really fast, um, but hopefully my presentation will be all that more hard hitting. So I decided to uh, present on the uses, misuses, and the issue of translation in ChatGPT. So us as academically honest and intellectual uh, students, especially in the humanities, are kind of you know confused about what we can use ChatGPT for and what would constitute a misuse of ChatGPT. Um, and I'm going to make the argument here, as Professor Montemore kind of did, uh, that ChatGPT, at least in its current state, is extremely mediocre in writing uh, important papers on philosophical issues that you know I think are central to the humanistic disciplines. Uh, but, and we'll see this later, um, at the end of my presentation, the issue of translation, right, the translating from one language to another, kind of indicates something to the contrary, that ChatGPT is understanding the meaning of uh, some text in one language and translating it to idiomatic text in another language. So um, as Dr. Trainer so eloquently noted, there are some obvious uses of uh, ChatGPT, right? It can provide us with general obvious knowledge. We can use it for maybe finding the synonyms, antonyms, and metaphors having to do with some words, checking for grammatical errors in our writing, providing valid or coherent arguments, um, not true, but valid or coherent ones, debugging code. Um, and we will see it actually is very good at translating uh, from Greek to English and Latin to English, but not so much in other languages. And that'll be kind of a philosophical issue that we'll maybe try to address. Okay, so, uh, I decided to show the misuses of ChatGPT by maybe considering a few important issues in philosophy that are very well known in philosophy, but perhaps not outside of philosophy. So Plato's views on women, um, ChatGPT, at least the highlighted part here, has gives an answer that is very much wrong. Plato never really thought that women should rule over just women and children. If they are rulers, rulers, are ones who rule over the whole polis, uh, but ChatGPT pronounces that as if it was fact, as if it, as if it was the final word on Plato. Um, once again, Plato asking Plato when, or asking ChatGPT when the different periods of Plato's thought occurred, it gives a very wrong answer. Uh, the Fido, which is the second to last name presented here, is agreed to be an early work of Plato, and it isn't too debatable and uh, Plato scholarship. So once again, does not give us a good answer on a very not too contested issue in Plato scholarship. Uh, and once again, if you ask it whether or not it is right or sure about its answer, it'll just be consistent with its previous answer and tell us, no, the Fido was a late period dialogue. So regardless of whether it is right or wrong, it is very much coherent and consistent. Um, Ishan, now, can, I, can I just, uh, I'm sorry for the interruption, but we cannot see your slides. We are still looking at the first slide. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and if it's not working again, I'm happy to share. Yeah, can you share it really quick? Thank you. What slide would you like me to go to? Um, you can go to the sixth one. Okay, yeah. So, I, like I was saying, ChatGPT will just give you the wrong answer if you ask it a question about the FIDO, um, but it will pronounce it whether like it is a cer certainty rather than a position. Um, okay, so now go to the next slide, please. Um, okay, so uh, could you present two or no? Just one so second. Um, yeah. Bottom right corner, Anastasia. Mm -hmm. Bottom right corner, there is. Mm -hmm. yes. Uh, yes. Right there. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so now if you ask ChatGPT to, uh, 
to answer a question that's hotly debated in Aristotelian scholarship. It once again give you an answer as if it was certain, right? So it's not in conversation with the rest of the philosophical community, but acts as if this was fact about Aristotle. Yes, Aristotle thought ethical knowledge was scientific knowledge, even though there are a lot of different positions on this very issue. Um, and actually, I think that this is probably a wrong answer, um, but it is not in conversation with the rest of the philosophical community, and therefore it doesn't feel like it needs to give even a citation to back up its claims. Um, the next slide, please. You just hit the arrow. Thank you. Um, and if you reword the question, it'll give you a consistent answer that once again is certain for it. Um, and we don't think that, you know, intellectually curious and academically honest humanity students are ones who give their opinion as if it was a certainty. Um, they will maybe give an opposing view, uh, cite their sources. But once again, as Montemayor noted, it seems like it is not in conversation with anyone else except for perhaps itself. Um, so go ahead. Uh, the next slide. And so I've been talking a lot of uh, trash about how ChatGPT really seems to not uh, be in conversation with anyone, doesn't understand what it's saying. Uh, and so I kind of decided to go and ask one of our professors, Jeremy Reed, uh, whether or not ChatGPT was good at translation. Translation, to me at least, is one of the ways we can see whether or not someone understands a text and can translate it into um, another language that captures the meaning, but perhaps not the literary uh, or the literal sense of what was translated. So um, we took an important passage from the Nicomachean Ethics. The bolded part says all art, and every inquiry. If you look at other translations of Aristotle, there's mostly an agreement that it's actually supposed to be every art and every inquiry. So this gave me little cause for concern, but also at the same time, I was like, oh yeah, okay. So it's not good at translation. Um, most scholars agree that it's every art and every inquiry. Um, go to the next slide, please, uh, Dr. Smirnova. Uh, the one after that. Okay, so we'll stop here. And so I asked uh, Jeremy uh, Reed to ask ChatGPT to translate something that had not never been translated before into English. Um, and so it identified it as Greek. And what was even more mind blowing, that it actually captured the meaning of what was translated. Um, not the liter literal like sense of what it was supposed to be, but rather the meaning of what was translated. And that was pretty concerning. It seemed to actually grasp the semantic rules and syntactical rules specific to Greek and somehow translated into idiomatic English that is also governed by its own semantic rules. Um, which was pretty concerning. And so go to the next slide, please. Um, so this was probably the most, uh, it gave, gave me most pause for concern. Um, so the bolded part, arguing that it's more fitting to show favors to someone who is not in love than to someone who is. Now this in the literal sense would be something like, uh, it is fitting to show favors to someone who is not in love and to someone who is, but it is more so to say to fitting to show favors to someone who is. And then the rest of the sentence, um, it seemed like what ChatGPT did here was make it into idiomatic English, something that flowed much better um, in our language than it does in the original. Uh, and we do think that is, some, that is something that a good translator does, and it's very hard to grasp. Um, you know, it's not talking in literalese, is what a new translator usually does. Uh, so we have kind of two options here. Uh, Greek and Latin seem to be languages that are translated from uh, very often um, into English. And so perhaps it has large data sets from which to derive such rules and make uh, and apply into novel contexts such as it did here. Um, and so that would be kind of more of the skeptical conclusion. It doesn't really understand what it's saying. Uh, or we could just say it kind of understands a little bit of Greek. Um, I asked a few other people, whether German or more obscure languages like my language, Hindi, that I know pretty well, uh, 
whether those translated well, it was able to translate those languages into English and it did far worse. So maybe that's a little, uh, maybe, maybe better news for us uh, as humanity students. Um, so can you go to the last slide? Let's remove, uh, Dr. Remove. And so, I mean, it's an open question now. So are we able to cite ChatGPT as a source when we do write our papers and under uh, what cir circumstances ought we, if it is possible that we can? And are we committed to some weird philosophical position? If we do agree that we can cite ChatGPT, is it now something that gives us some gives us meaningful content um, and has a position? So yeah, that, those were just questions I wanted to kind of pose to the rest of the forum. And yeah, that's my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Ishan. So this is, uh, uh, this is a great um, um, exploration of chat GPT's capabilities. And it's also uh, interesting to see how uh, how it performs with respect to other languages. Um, I, uh, I must admit that um, myself and students in my lab, we did a couple of um, 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 experiments uh, using various languages. So a student of mine uh, used an informal dialect of Japanese and it actually understood it quite well. Um, and then I chatted, I had a rather long conversation with it in Ukrainian. So that was also, uh, I can report that that works uh, very well. Your last question about um, uh, attribution, right? So w w I, I think it's, uh, it's very important uh, to try to address this question uh, as a community. Um, so where exactly, uh, what is chat GPT? So uh, shall students, acknowledge that they use this tool if they use it? And um, uh, if so, uh, what are the implications for using versus not using this tool as part of the uh, learning process? So does it disadvantage someone or does it, is it, again, we've heard, we've learned today that there are so many advantages to it, but then students can make their own choices, right? And then um, if you choose you to use or not to use chat GPT, uh, whether it gives you an advantage or not. So I think that's something that we can start to think about uh, as a community. So thank you very much. I want to thank our uh, panelists. And uh, now we will open the floor for questions. So we have several questions uh, in the chat already. Um, and um, starting from the one that was, um, uh, asked uh, um, uh, very early uh, uh, in the uh, event. Um, so there is a question that um, asks about um, chat GPT and um, uh, whether its release can be compared to that of a calculator. And I think there is also a related question in the chat um, that um, in a Q&A window, that points out that by the time students got to use calculators, they actually learned uh, basic operations. So I want to pose this question to our panelists uh, and see what um, um, what the opinions are. Is ChatGPT like a calculator, or is it something different? Uh, I mean, I think it's a really good question and a great comparison. Just in a simple way, I could imagine that, you know, it's fairly straightforward in K-12 to not have calculators out when you're teaching students the underlying concepts of math, and this would be similar. But as they move, you know, higher into, you know, more abstract or complicated uh, skills, then the calculator becomes a necessary tool, maybe. Um, but language is different from math. <laughs> so there's, you know, there's a lot of other aspects to it where I think the analogy doesn't work as well. I can take a stab at that question because it's a very interesting one. I have been thinking about it. And I think my conclusion is that the difference between the two parallels is in order to use the calculator, we still have to use our human intelligence to translate the problem into a formula. We had to do that translation using our intelligence. 
we have to formulate it and then the calculator can take over. But with chat GPT, it's giving us a lot more freedom. Uh, it's doing, it's picking up a lot more slack than what we had to do with calculator. Thank you. Thank you both for your answers. And I just want to follow up quickly um, regarding um, what we are assessing in our classes. So I think there was a lot of discussion that um, chat GPT um, um, can perform well on um, factual tasks. So maybe we should not ask our students factual tasks. But um, it's also true that um, in uh, when we teach writing, there are different levels of proficiency, right? So we have students who are just acquiring basic writing skills. They're learning the rules of syntax. They're learning um, punctuation. Uh, so, and uh, again, for this context, it looks like uh, chat GPT is a technology that is readily available to assist. So should it be, um, should we limit its use for uh, students who are just um, learning uh, these fundamental principles of writing, or would it be beneficial for them to have access to this technology? I don't know if other panelists want to weigh in. Uh, sure. <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that uh, the I mean, in a way, the, the word calculator is is very interesting, right? Uh, so there's the, the computer, too, right? So in the, in the NASA project, you know, there's very famous woman who coded, who call computers. Uh, so we are calculators and computers, but in the in the context, and this is something that that uh, that is, I think, implicit in what what uh, Jennifer said. In the context of linguistic communication, being a calculator almost entails manipulation, right? And I think that's something that we should definitely use. Like I, I love the example of Ishan of like comparing human translation to GPT translation. I think that would be almost like you know transformative of our field. Um, but that doesn't entail manipulation, right? And translation is a straightforward exercise, but but if you're engaging in a what I was calling a genuine communicative exchange, and and again, that's what education is supposed to be, you don't want to replace the kind of thing we do in classroom with with just like a lot of uh, chat GPT mediation because it's not mm -hmm. it's it's just calculation, it's not mediation. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is definitely I, I see I saw that someone said something about Eliza. We are precisely because we're social animals. <clears throat> we're very prone at giving the benefit of the doubt to any speaker of genuine community. Eliza is really not at all. I mean, if you you also mentioned Eliza, I think, Anastasia, it's not at all. I mean, it's the most unsophisticated thing ever. But people developed strong feelings towards her, right? Like there were people, there were people that wanted to be alone with her. And she could barely say anything. And so, so the, the thing is, we're we're prone already to 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 give all sorts of benefits of the doubt to chat GPT, that chat GPT. But um, we need to be very cautious. We need to be very very aware of like our own bias to convey skillful, meaningful capacities to them, and the fact that it can be just a calculator. It can be just literally something that we need to interpret just the way we interpret a calculator. It's interesting to think about that in light of the controversy that just happened with the um, Vanderbilt administrator who used chat GPT to write the condolence, the sympathy email after the mass shooting, mm -hmm. a moment of singularity, our entire problem, <laughs> our, yeah. all of our problems in one moment. But people were outraged that he had used chat GPT to write what was meant to be a heartfelt essay or email about a tragedy. So on the one hand, we, we, we definitely don't want a calculator writing, but then on the other hand, what you're saying, Carlos, and about Eliza, it's very easy to feel that the, you know, that there's some kind of sentience there. 
and that there is something human. So it's very interesting to me. I mean, I think the the Michigan or the example with the shooting tells us something about how readers are going to feel about text generation, right? Text generating machines, which is different from how I feel if I know that you used a calculator to make something. I feel mm -hmm. fine about that, <laughs> but I, I feel different. And, and and just to build on that, uh, we don't develop strong feelings towards calculators, but we right. do towards this. So that, that the, the famous case different. of the of the Lambda engineer who was fired from Google mm -hmm. because he said, you know, I talked to this thing and he told me that it has rights and I think it's conscious. And the, the people go, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it, it's it, This is a part of our human uh, tendencies, right? I mean, we we when we speak, we engage each other. We We want to be engaged we don't want to be manipulated or or or, or you know uh treated as, as as some kind of instrument so um i think that's where i i see the the biggest risk and the biggest problem i mean and this is a wonderful example the the, the example of, of of writing a letter of condolence mm -hmm. just in, in this robotic mm -hmm. kind of i mean in the context of medicine it's also problematic right. and in, in education right. it's also really fundamental well, yeah. so with my students when they were like for for writing you don't care about it's fine um i tried to get them to say an example of that kind of writing that they don't care about right what what are we talking about here because you know would you how comfortable are you outsourcing the writing of training manuals for pilots or warnings on medical devices how how comfortable are we Mm -hmm. What? Where is the human in that? Because I think all of us instinctively know we want a human involved somewhere there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think my biggest fear is that, you know, in the case of the condolence letter, we know that that an AI wrote it, mm -hmm. but at some point we're going to not know, right? And just to have that constant suspicion. Yeah. Um, it will lead, I think, to new efforts to detect and maybe even new ways of performing hu being human. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. Even driving has been really hard to automate for these more complicated human questions, like who's at fault if there's a crash? These kinds of questions that involve people somehow and could split second decision making seems like something that could be done. I mean, it is being done, but it gets complicated when humans are involved in language is never not human involved. Yes, I, I wanted to say one other thing. Oh, sorry. I, I just wanted to throw out there that I think these analogy analogies and sort of getting our students to think about mm -hmm. um, chat GPT in terms of analogy, I, I something that came to mind, I teach a lot of classes on music and the history of music and technology. And I remember last time I taught this class, which was a long time ago, my students were like really bothered by auto-tune, you know, right. and by the idea that, um, and, and even by garage band a little bit, like that people can, you don't have to learn how to play an instrument anymore. Like don't have to actually, you know, um, sing in tune and that the machine can correct it. And, you know, this idea, you know, we were sort of questioning. So what is authenticity, right? I mean, it's always, you know, like what is authenticity? Where is the source of creativity? Um, these are all interesting questions, but I think to get our students to think about them as well uh, is important. Yeah. And I heard there's a visual AI that's very similar yes. that that you can say like draw a painting of a toilet in the shit style of Picasso and it's amazing. I don't Curly. know what it's called, but Wally yeah. is one of them or Dolly, 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 right? Dolly, yeah. yeah. It's currently being sued too for copyright infringement of a lot of artists' work that it's relying on. So there's a lot of a lot going on. Thank you. Uh, so let's move on to the next question. I, I We have such a good conversation, so I feel uh, really bad to redirect it a little bit. But uh, we have a question about um, asynchronous uh, online courses. And there is a question about how such courses should deal with chat GPT used by students. Mm -hmm. Again, perhaps it's um, it goes back to the question, do we want to ban it? And I think uh, the answer we hear here is that we actually want to work it, right? But there are still some concerns. So what do you think about um, asynchronous online classes? I mean, it's a very good question. I'm, I, I think I would approach it in the same way I'm gonna approach it in my face-to-face -face classes. Um, yeah, I, th I think the same 
conversations need to happen about technology and uh, information literacy and academic integrity and all of that. I have a colleague who's very open to talking about it in class, but he has outright banned it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there are detection programs now, which mm -hmm. I don't think are, are foolproof, but he just wanted to just make it really clear. If I catch mm -hmm. you doing this, that's the end, you know, mm -hmm. and I might catch you. So it's not worth it just to sort of mm -hmm. take that out of the equation, but then talk about it, you know, mm -hmm. and think about its uses. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you, you can't say, sure, just do it. Like, I think we have to say we value students' voice, right? That is the point. Uh, but detection and policing are complicated too. And they always have been with plagiarism. There's always a, a trust issue and there's always students making mistakes and students having a lot of, you know, complicated reasons for their behavior. Well, actually, I don't know. I've tried, uh, so like asking it a question and then it would give me a response. And then I'd go to another account and ask ChatGPT whether or not it wrote it. Even if you changed maybe like 10% of it, it'll say yes. So that's one way of like detecting whether or not it wrote something. Mm -hmm. um, mm. But I don't know. I don't think you should expect instructors to do that for every assignment. So, yeah. There's also the question of putting students work back into it, which I hesitate to do. If they did write it, <laughs> I'm worried about that too. And I think there is a related question um, in a Q&A. Uh, about um, traditional assessment methods um, and um, the amount of examination we see in classrooms. So that's the last question in the Q&A. The question is, do we think that chat GPT can be a source for individual learning exploration within space that is providing less feedback? Hmm. Well, I said something quickly, and I'm, I'm sorry, I need to leave. I think I told you before, but uh, <clears throat> again, that's another word, right? Like philosophers always get stuck with words. Uh, feedback is 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 an, a communicative act. Uh, from my perspective, ChatGPT cannot do that. Cannot give you feedback. Mm -hmm. It can it can give you something that looks a lot like feedback, mm -hmm. and it can give you something that looks perfectly grammatically uh, incredibly accurate. But I don't think it is at the level of giving you feedback. And this is the kind of thing that I think is very important that we're careful in, in education, that it's fine if you're a company to hype your product and say, oh, my product is is, is paying attention or, you know, or it's uh, the, 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 the new, the network. I love a paper that says that there's nothing neural about the neural network. So it's a neural network. Well, it doesn't really do anything like this remotely like the brain because the brain is a chemical, biological thing that evolves. So it, it is, it, it's fine if you're in, in industry to use metaphors, but if in education is risky, right? Mm -hmm. So if you say chat GPT will give you feedback for this course, I think, you, first of all, I think that's false. And then secondly, students would feel very disengaged from class if, if, uh, if, they, if they think that chat GPT is, is a, a source of guidance and that the professor is there to, to uh, I don't know. Code teach with chat GPT. I don't know. It's it's it, it would be I think it would send the, the wrong message if we if we over uh, use it. And I'm so very sorry, I need to to leave. <laughs> Thank you, Carlos. It was very nice mm -hmm. to, to to be part of this panel. Very nice yeah. to meet you. Yeah. Now we have um uh, a range of interesting questions um uh in a, uh, in Q and A. Uh, so um, one is um, uh, the question about um, um, the difference between chat GPT and earlier technologies. So we are discussing here how this technology um, raises so many questions, but is it really different from uh, uh, earlier technologies? Um, and um, uh, what do you think? <laughs> Does it make it worse? That's the question. Does it make it worse in terms of um, the number of challenges that we now face? I can take a stab at that. It is different. 
um, compared it, it this is relative right what what are we comparing it to um, the technology that's mentioned in that question it is chat gpt is different um, in terms of its framing as well as its size of course um, but it is a paradigm shift in terms of how it is formulated and i if i can add on to what carlos said earlier i think the reality is not going to be either or um, going to be somewhere in the middle because the cats are out the bag as they say there's no banning this thing i don't think it's going to help us any of us by banning this and denying that it can be used in a creative constructive way i don't want to get hung up on the word feedback but based on my personal experience with it the tool was quite capable of directing my exploratory inquiry about that particular topic in fruitful directions so it made my learning quite efficient um i was able to get my answers now there is the question about accuracy it's not always correct and that is a problem that people are working on right now um and that's the the big caveat that unfortunately us humans we tend to start trusting and become very gullible um and we'll have to train students and ourselves to not do that but i don't think we can completely dismiss it as a a study partner that's that's my take and experience Thank you, Annika. I, I think that I, uh, again, coming from a linguistic perspective, uh, I think uh, what is the most, surpri the most surprising part to me is that ChatGPT made, um, it's a very large language model, right? So they just, um, uh, they have, it uses a vast amount of training data. It has an insane number of parameters. But what is surprising to me is that just making this quantitative change we are seeing a qualitative change because again, what I see all these linguistic tasks that were a challenge not so long ago, all these questions are suddenly solved in chat GPT. And of course there are caveats, but again, not, let's not to forget that only three years ago, uh, textual entailment was a problem. So if I say, um, I have never seen a hummingbird not flying, we immediately understand that it's not, this uh, text does not entail that we have never seen a hummingbird, right? But again, double negation, it was a problem. It's not a problem anymore. And there are so many examples that, um, uh, again, that are uh, so many cases that are uh, solved um, now just by quantitatively, by making this quantitative change. Uh, it's seven o'clock, so I want to thank everyone. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you, our panelists. Um, thank you to our audience. Uh, I also want to thank um, the LCA uh, technical uh, events team, and I want to thank Dean Clavier for her support of this event. Um, if you are interested uh, to have this conversation going, um, I will send, uh, I will post my email in the chat. So please reach out to me and we can, uh, we can continue this uh, discussion. So thank you everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Anastasia for putting it together. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, coming to, to the table and uh, coming on board with this um, topic. I think it's very important that we discuss it as a community and there are so many different perspectives, right? So uh, I, I think it's important to share this knowledge and um, our position on this technology. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. folks. Have a good evening. It's really nice to meet you, you all. all. Yep. Yeah. Thank Take you. care. Thank you, Anastasia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,
Uh, there is a question about the recording. Uh, yes, uh, the recording will be available, I think, on the LC web page. Uh, Aaron, is that is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you very much.